Okay, so we're going to continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew with chapter 14. But before you turn there, before we go back there, uh, uh, let's talk some about using the Beatitudes as a lens or a framework uh, in our study of, of the book of Matthew. First of all, Beatitudes, which are found where, Jim? Do you recall? Yeah, in the Sermon on the Mount, right at the beginning. Yes, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and that's in chapter... Five of Matthew, and uh, we call them beatitudes. Why, Jim? Do you recall when we call them beatitudes? Uh, the word means blessed. Exactly. It comes from a Latin word that means blessed. A, a little girl once said, "Well, you call them beatitudes because they tell you what your attitude should be." <laughs> I, th I like that a lot better. But anyway, it comes from a Latin word that means blessed. But we struggle a little bit <clears throat> with this word blessed. The very oldest English translations, I think use this word blessed and it was so ingrained I don't think I think other translators have been uh, hesitant to, to change that but what, what do we really mean when we say uh, for example uh, blessed are the poor in spirit what does that mean when we say they're, they're blessed Somebody, if you're poor in spirit you're really blessed what does that mean it also means you're happy well somebody says happy but frankly in, in light of today's lesson especially I think happy quite gets it. I, anybody else have a have a uh, an operational a word that we could plug in instead of bless for all these beatitudes? I think he's calling his followers not to be so nearsighted, concentrating on their difficulties, but on the attendant lessons that are out there. there there's something happy. Look at that. Okay, so a, a, a little bit of hindrance with my hearing and with with the mask here, but Jim says that. The, the, this concept of blessed is, is not just, you know, will I be happy today or happy by Friday. It's taking a longer view of God's, of God's work. I once uh, attended a congregation where uh, the great Bob Hendren, who's a Greek scholar, said one way to translate this word is to be congratulated. To be congratulated. And, well, yeah, maybe if you take the long view, it is to be congratulated. But... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that a part of this has to do with saying, you know, if you have this quality, then you're really in a good place with God. You're really in a good place with God. Your relationship with God is on a firm footing if you have these qualities. So let's just do this, and I don't know if you can see my green marker, and you folks that watch on the video probably can't see it at all, but we know that uh, for purposes of this uh, tabulation anyway, we're going to say that there are uh, eight Beatitudes, okay? And so let's just list these qualities because we're gonna use them later. In fact, there's a place on your sheet if you have the handout question three, and if you wanna make notes, you can just, just list them here. So we already know the first one, we mentioned that. It says that the poor in spirit. Okay, and what's the next one? What's the next one? Blessed are those who mourn. mourn. Good. Now, if you can do this without looking, <laughs> that's really what we want you to do. <laughs> I think most of you are able to read, but anyway, the let's see if we can. Serve an age where that's not possible. Uh, well, uh, believe me, I feel your pain. You know, the great thing about Easter, when you get to be our age, is you can hide your own Easter eggs. So, yesterday, <laughs> Becky and I were outside, and we had the fire in the fire pit. Boy, wouldn't it be great to have us some more right about now? And uh, see, Becky gives me the chocolate and tells me to hide it because otherwise she knows she'll eat all of it. Don't tell her I told you that. But I couldn't remember where I hid it, so no s'mores yesterday. So anyway, I, I, I found it last night, though. Uh, anyway, more. What's next? Meek. The meek. Great. And then after that? Those um Spiritual hunger and I'm and thirst too. So I'm gonna put hunger and thirst for righteousness the longer verse here. Okay, and then after that, blessed are the and somebody whose name is not Matthias can give us the next one. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart. Those are the ones that get to see God, right? And then after that, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. 
and then after that, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, years ago, somebody uh, told me how to remember these. And if you use this uh, uh, approach, you always have your crib notes with you because you use your body. Poor in spirit, people who are poor in spirit, they drop their head like this, okay? You mourn with your eyes. Meek implies that you have a small nose, that you don't have a big nose that pokes itself around and dominates other people. Then you hunger and thirst with your mouth, right? Then after that is merciful, and so you reach out and pat somebody's shoulder when you're merciful. And then there's the heart, blessed are the pure in heart. And then when you're a peacemaker, you are gonna reach out your hand if you're persecuted or if you're a persecutor, you kick somebody, okay? So there you can use your body as your visual aid reminder, and you can remember these, uh, <clears throat> remember these beatitudes. Uh, okay, so let's use this as kind of a framework. And what I want to do here is read the first 12 verses of Matthew 14. So uh, if someone has that, uh, Jim, do you mind reading that whole thing for us, 1 through 12? <clears throat> Matthew 14. 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and uh, she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now, when Jesus. Oh, okay, okay. Him, That's you good. want to stop there? Stop right there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this, first of all, we need to talk about these guys a little bit. Uh, the, the, the most uh, gruesome soap opera that you've ever seen, the most, uh, the most uh, dysfunctional family that you've ever had any knowledge of, these guys have it beat, the Herod family. They are real. In fact, I'm thinking the story of the Herod family would make a wonderful miniseries. It probably would have great ratings if somebody, because it would be rated, you know, TVMA or R or whatever. These guys were just, you know, awful people, really. And it all starts with this guy. Well, it doesn't all start with him. Actually, you can go back several generations behind him and things are bad, but... Herod the Great, and, and he really, in terms of his earthly accomplishments, he was great. A lot of the things that he built are still there, okay? He was quite a builder. But this is the Herod that's famous in the Bible for doing what? In the book of Matthew, for doing what? Killing the Yes, he ordered the slaughter of the innocents, the little boys in Bethlehem. We read about that in chapter 2 of Matthew. Anyway, Herod died an awful, gruesome death. He had some sort of you know, some people think it was, was brought on by God because, I mean, he was a wicked person, very wicked guy. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> he, he died this, this gruesome death, and then they, they broke his uh, kingdom up among three of his surviving sons. I say surviving sons because he had some of them killed. Uh, quite a guy. Anyway, so the, the, the Herod we're going to run in today is called Antipas. That's kind of his nickname. And then there was Philip. He's an actor in our story today. 
And then uh, there's another guy, I think his name is Archelaus. It's easy to get these guys mixed up. We run into this guy again in the book of Matthew and uh, in, in, in the Jesus trial. Pilate sends Jesus to Herod and Herod sends him back, of course, so nothing happens there. But <clears throat> this guy here, they broke Herod the Great's uh, kingdom up and uh, had these sub-rulers they called tetrarchs. Tetrarch really means ruler over one-fourth, but later it came to mean just a kind of like a sub-king or something. So <laughs> these guys are tetrarchs. So what happens is uh, Philip is married to a woman named, named Herodias. I don't know why she was named that. That was her name. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> soap opera like, it turns out that Antipas divorces his first wife, which incidentally causes a war with his father-in-law, but that's another story. And he gets together with Herodias. Now, before they had, uh, before they had uh, divorced, Philip and Herodias had a daughter, okay? So try to keep all this in mind. It's, I know there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of facts, and particularly if you can't see the green on the board, it, it gets confusing, but <clears throat> the thing that's important for us today is to know that Antipas, today's Herod, had married his brother's wife. I don't know if they had an affair and got a divorce or whatever, but he married his brother's wife. Now, according to the Old Testament law of the Jews, that is incest. That is strictly forbidden. You don't marry your brother's wife unless, unless what, Matthias? You can do it, but when do you do it? Unless he died, he's dead. If, his brother, if your brother has died and has no children, then you're commanded to do it to bring up children for him to raise up children for him. But otherwise, it's, it's strictly forbidden. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> John the Baptist had the gall to, uh, to tell Herod, Antipas, that what he was doing was wrong in the eyes of God. And that didn't make, uh, that didn't make Herod very happy, but it really, it really set off Herodias. And so she was, uh, she was a very wicked, uh, cunning person. And so she does what to get control of the situation? What does, what does Herodias do to get control of the situation? Get John killed. Yeah, they're having a big party. And the place for the party is still there, more or less. Where is the party being held? It's Herod's birthday, okay? And so where's the party being held? I'm not sure it's really clear in the text where this is, but I told you his father, Herod the Great, was a great builder. One thing he built was a, a fortress on a bluff over the Dead Sea. Now, Herod Antipas controlled uh, two, basically two territories, Galilee, where Jesus has been teaching, and then down south, Perea, which is kind of on the other side of the Dead Sea from Judea. And uh, so he's, he's down there, and he's at this fortress, and it's got a dungeon, okay? So John the Baptist is down in the dungeon. Herod and his buddies are up high getting drunk, and Herodias says, you know, this daughter of mine... She's just a teenager, but she's really beautiful. I'll send her in there to do a dance, and we'll see if we can get some action on John the Baptist. And she told the daughter, she says, if, if they like your dance, and they want to, you know, give you something, just, just tell them you want the head of John the Baptist. But you have to use a special word if you ask Herod for anything. And that is hear. I want to hear. In other words, I want to hear it now. Because otherwise, he'll just say, sure, and put it off, and put it off, and put it off. You won't ever get it. So that's what happens. And that's how uh, John the Baptist is, is murdered. So let's just think about these qualities, these eight qualities that we see in the, uh, hmm. well, not only do we not have any markers left, 
we have lost our dry erase uh, eraser. So anyway, we'll, we'll get this back eventually, but I need your help. This is question three on your sheet. So how do we evaluate Herod in light of the Beatitudes? First of all, does he come across as someone who's poor in spirit? Does he come across as someone who's... who's no, he's high and mighty. He's high and mighty. He's pompous. You know, just to, just to take somebody's uh, head off at, at a whim. Uh, is, is he someone who mourns? Is he, is he bereaved? Well, no, he makes other people mourn. Uh, meek. Would you describe Herod as meek? Yeah, I, th I think uh, Jim's right on target here. Another way to translate that word is, is gentle instead of meek. So, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You know, when I, when I hear about this guy that's, that's uh, first of all, he's married his brother's wife. He's having a drunken party for his birthday. And then the entertainment for the party is a, a, some sort of a sensual dance by his stepdaughter. He's not really hungry for righteousness. You know, he's... He, he, in fact, yeah, we would call that pushing the envelope. You know, he's pushing the envelope. Uh, any, I think anybody can can comment on this. What about what about the merciful department? How do how does Herod come across that? Who is Herod merciful to? He is merciful to someone. Who is he Herod merciful to? What about what about Herod? Is he merciful to Herod? Because he's, you know, it would, it would really be bad if Herod lost face in front of his buddies, right? So he just goes ahead and has John killed because he doesn't want to look like a paper tiger in front of his friends. Uh, pure in heart. And probably the reason he hadn't had him killed before is that he, he was concerned right. about how, what he would look like if he did that because everybody... Everybody was a supporter of John. Even dictators have to be concerned about public opinion. So, yeah, that's... that's the, in fact, the interesting thing about Herod and Matthias, and I had this study the other night, it's how many things he's afraid of. How many things he's afraid of. It opens up, he's afraid of John's ghost. He think, here's about Jesus, and he thinks, this is, this is John come back to life. You know, it's, it's, uh, the, the big word for this is revivification. It's this idea of the dead come back to life to get you. And so he's scared of that. He's scared of everything. <clears throat> well, anyway, I, I, I think you see here, now this is easy to do with Herod. What about with, with Doug Shields? Can I sit down at the end of the day and evaluate myself in these, in these categories and these features and say, you know, how did my actions today typify these, these characteristics? Now, <clears throat> The question, the, the, the real question today, the, the one that I think I, I want you to struggle with with me a little bit, is at the bottom of this little chart I put on your handout. And I think we can all agree that Herod, you know, makes a D or an F in all these categories, okay? So that's easy to do. But the question I want you to struggle with, if Herod is so unblessed, you know, all these, all these categories get you blessed, right? If he's so unblessed, then why is he still king? And John has a lot of these uh, characteristics, and he's in the dungeon, and he ends up being murdered in a very brutal, horrible way. So how do we square that up? How do we square that up? You know... It, now, remember what Jesus told his followers. He said, now, if you can be poor in spirit, or if you, Matthias, can be persecuted for righteousness, then what do you get? You get the kingdom of heaven, not of Perea, not of Galilee, you know, some third world country. No, you get the kingdom of heaven. If you can just be poor in spirit. But that's not what happens here. Instead, John gets the axe, you know. What's going on? How do we square all that together? 
Sing song, what do you think? Jim, what are your thoughts on this? I think you mentioned something earlier that is a key here. I'm sorry, would you ask the question again? Yeah, so, so if, if Herod fails on all these things, then, then why does he get to be king? He gets, he's the winner. He's rich. He's a king. He gets all his way about everything. And, and, but he's, he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any of these qualities in his life. And John has a lot of them in his life, very obviously, and he ends up in the dungeon being beheaded. He's not chosen to be king on that basis. He's born into it, it looks like, and that's all there is to it. I think, I think you know, we, we really have to change our way of looking at life <clears throat> to square this up. And I think early on you said take blessed implies taking a longer view. And, and I think that's, that's important. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important for us to realize what Jesus said about Satan when he called him the prince of this world. That we're, we're in foreign territory in this world and, and, and these things are not going to be squared up. And, and when we run into uh, you know, persecution or trials or, or things that cause us to mourn and, and be poor in spirit, we, we should realize that that's what we're supposed to expect. You know, Jesus said, servant's not greater than his master. If they treat me this way, what are they going to do to you? Don't you get it? You know, it's, it's, it's what to expect. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> Jesus gets the report from John's followers uh, in verse, verse 12 or 13 here. I may have the wrong, wrong reference here on the sheet. Yeah, <clears throat> verse 12. They went and told Jesus. So how does this make you feel? One way to study the gospel is to put yourself in the story. And try to imagine what it's like if you are on the edge of the crowd or you're one of the 12 or you're, you're there in person. So you get this news, and so how does it make you feel? What do you think, Jim? How does it make you feel? I'm scared. Yeah, yeah. It is it, happening to John. We're next. Yeah, we're next. We're next. And it, 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 it's it also John evidently very close to Jesus, perhaps, or you know, he was a relative, his, his mother and Mary are relatives. And so there's a sense of bereavement there, as we feel when, when we have a loved one die, mourning and grief, but most of all, uh, repulsion, disgust, and terror, basically terror. So, time to get away, uh, withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this idea, of Jesus withdrawing from the crowds uh, is coming up again and again, and particularly in this section of Matthew chapters 14 through 17, but it, it starts in the middle of chapter 13 where he's telling all these parables about the kingdom, and in verse uh, 36 of chapter 13, he left the crowd and went into the house, and then the remainder of chapter 13 evidently is, is just a private conversation between Jesus and the twelve. Okay. And so we're, we're going to see him making a conscious over effort to withdraw from the multitudes, withdraw from the crowds for the next few chapters. And, and you can think of, of reasons why uh, in, in, in the timing of his ministry. We won't spend much time on that now. At any rate, uh, I'd like to read verses 13 through 21, uh, which... Uh, you and I call the feeding of the 5,000. This particular miracle is the only one that is in all four Gospels. So evidently it's, it's quite significant in his ministry. <clears throat> Question on your sheet that I'd like for you to think about while we read through this is, what parallels do you see here between Jesus and Moses? Between Jesus and Moses. <clears throat> when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. 
As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves, and then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. And most of us can remember a time in this country, uh, or in your country, in your home country, uh, it's true of Matthias. Matthias, how many children are in your family? Eight. Eight children, you told me this before. Eight children. So Matthias has seven brothers and sisters, and uh, that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. So if there are 5,000 men, and they brought along a few wives and children, this is a whole lot of people, okay? This is a big multitude of people that got fed <clears throat> that day. But I ask you to think about parallels between Jesus and Moses here. That's really a big deal in John chapter 6. John's account of the same miracle. But what, what parallels do you see here between Jesus and Moses? Can, can you think of something, Glenda? Maybe I'm coming out of left field here. What about you, Jim? What about you? Well, you know, uh, Moses was the instrument to which God fed the children in the wilderness. And uh, I don't think Moses did it out of Moses' concern for the people as much as it was for him. And uh, Jesus' reason for doing it was not the same as what Moses' reason for doing it. Okay, so, so there's some, some differences here, certainly, between the two. But we see a multitude of God's people being sus physically sustained in the wilderness, important point, in the wilderness, by a leader, a teaching leader, by the way. So, so those are parallels. Uh, the uh, the people in John chapter 6, it's really kind of funny. They said, uh, you know, Jesus would love for you to do another, another miracle. Now, Moses, you know, remember, he, he fed the people every day. Hint, hint. How about, you know, open up the cafeteria again? And Jesus says, you know, the cafeteria is now closed. You know, you're, you're, we're, we're, this is not a, a welfare program, so we're not going to do that anymore. It's kind of funny. But at, at any rate, we, we, we do see a parallel here. <clears throat> Jesus as the teacher and the lawgiver and, and also gives, you know, physical sustenance to these people. Now, <clears throat> remember that Jesus is trying to retreat here. He's trying to get away. He's, he's had a demanding several chapters, and he hears that his close friend has been martyred. All these emotions that we identified earlier... They're just trying to get away to a lonely place just to be by themselves a bit. And uh, uh, Sing Sung's son, David, and my son, Bradley, are both undergoing intensive training to become doctors right now. Or they would be happy to. They are doctors right now, but, you know, it's part of the process. And, and it, it gets to be physically, mentally, and especially emotionally overwhelming because all these sick people keep coming. And there's never any let-up. There's never any let-up. Particularly this year. Particularly this year. The, the hospitals tend to be full. And, and so it's, it's you know, you, you work until, from can until can't. And, and there's always somebody else with a sad story, with a heart-rending situation, with a life-threatening condition. And it just goes on and on and on. And, and so... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just like Jesus and, and his 12. You know, they can't get a break. But what's Jesus' emotional response when he, you know, gets off on vacation? He pulls into the, the shore and over the hill comes all these sick people. What, what's, what's his emotional response here? The word is what? 
compassion, compassion which ties directly back in to uh, this beatitude right here, merciful, right? So Jesus, a, a good, Herod, an example of not beatitude. Jesus, an example of, yes, the way it works. Okay. So he, he then uses <coughs> this uh, as a teaching opportunity. And, and one lens to view the Gospels is a study of how Jesus discipled other people. It's interesting, in my lifetime, that has become a verb. You know, I think when I was growing up, disciple was a noun. But now discipling is a verb. Probably not bad. Probably a good idea. But uh, he says, you know, it's, I think we will use this as a class exercise. So his instructions to the class are, you give them something to eat. Now, why does he do this? I mean, he, he's got to know them, Matthias, that they can't do that. So why does he tell them to do it? He's teaching the disciples. Um. While you're thinking, I, I, I can't hear really well. I think your, your comment was a good one, but while you're thinking about that a little bit more, I want to tell you a story. And uh, I think that Jim and Jim and Glenda are probably too old to understand. You have to be just a certain age to really get this. But when I got to be in about seventh grade, which was middle school, all of the schools came up with a new idea for teaching math in class. It was called New Math. Maybe Jim remembers a little bit about this. New Math. And the whole idea about New Math was you don't tell the students what they're supposed to do. You give them problems, and they go home and work on the problems so they'll discover the math for themselves. Mm -hmm. Then they come back to school, and they've discovered the math themselves. Sing song, if you, I'm going to tell you the truth. In the seventh grade, we had a math teacher, and she would assign these problems, and we didn't know how to do them. And if you, if you didn't have something on your paper, on your homework paper, when you came back, she would march you out in the hall and give you, uh, and, and paddle you. That was the old math and the new math together. I never have liked new math since then. But anyway, it was this idea that you'll discover it on your own. So Jesus is giving them something they cannot do, the problem without an explanation, like the new math. He didn't paddle them, though, but what did they discover? What did they discover? That we should not rely on ourselves, Lord, we provide. Yes. Yes. You, you take what little you have, and put it in, put it in the master's hands, and then just do what he tells you to do, and, and somehow it, it all works out. It all works out. It's enough. So God uses people, but He is entirely sufficient. He is entirely sufficient to provide uh, for, for what is needed. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> He is also twelve baskets of pieces left over. A God of abundance. A God of abundance. And as we become more like Him. We, uh, we subscribe to this idea of abundance. Okay, so following that, we have uh, the, the account of Jesus walking on water. Uh, <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So think about just this class right here, just this uh, six of us, and we're in a big rowboat, and we're in the middle of, let's say, Sardis Lake at night, okay? And there are big waves. It's a windstorm. I'm not happy. How about you? You know, who forgot to bring the outboard motor? I mean, what about a light? You know, this is not a good thing. Shortly before dawn, now this has been going on for a while, okay? It's, it's, they said it in the fourth watch of the night. The Jews divided the night up into four three-hour watches. So uh, they didn't check their watches, okay? But 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., roughly speaking, fourth watch of the night, uh, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. 
When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Second ghost we run into in this chapter. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Okay, so... We're almost done with our time. We've got about a minute or two left here. But I want you to think with me, what's the main point of this story? What's the main point of this story? I think uh, that last bit you read also answers the question about why he charged him to keep the Bible now. They're going to have trouble coming here to do Jesus' will here. The power of God is literally among them in Jesus. And whatever is evil, he can do. So he's going through these episodes with them. Back all the way to the crucifixion, trying to get them to grasp what it means for them to be the Son of God. Okay, so this this is, I think, I, I'm going to echo what Jim said here. Jesus has been referred to as the Son of God a couple of times previously in the book of Matthew by the writer or by somebody from heaven, an angel or something. Maybe God said, This is my beloved Son. Okay. But this is the first time human beings. Human beings have said, you are the Son of God. So, you know, these guys are fishermen, a lot of them. They're from the Galilee region. And so he's putting it in terms that they can understand. A storm on the sea. A storm. So sometimes God puts things down where we can understand it. He makes a point to us. And it's up to us to respond with the kind of faith that they do. I really appreciate your working with me today the rusty uh arrangements we've had to make and uh, mask and so forth my hearing and all these things i really appreciate you being here today and i look forward to our our class growing a bit uh maybe uh Philemon and kuba can come next week i'm not giving up on those guys so i want to see them here too and uh sing song thank you so much for for braving and being here today i appreciate that so Okay, let's uh, let's stop for today. <laughs>